All right, now if you have your Bible, let's go to 1 John chapter 3 this morning. 1 John chapter 3. Let me introduce you to Andrew Wilson. This is Andrew on the screen behind me, and you'll need to follow me on all of this, all right? Andrew is a pastor in London. He has a blog called Think Theology, and he writes for the Gospel Coalition and writes for Christianity Today. And a while back on his blog, he uh, posted an article where he was responding to a question that had been raised by another London pastor, a friend of his named Adrian Warnock, and this is a picture of Adrian, okay? So Adrian had posed the question, what is the meaning of the word Christian? Just take that word and boil it down to its essence. This is what the word means. Now, at one level, we would say a Christian is a Christ one. It's one who follows Christ. And in the same way that you'd say that a Marxist is somebody who follows the ideology of Marx or that uh, a Keynesian is somebody who buys into Keynesian economic theory. But being a Christian is more than just buying into somebody's theory, right? It's more than just saying, I agree, this is the philosophy I'm going to follow. A Christian is more than just an adherent to a set of beliefs. So back to Andrew, can we go back to Andrew's picture? He was chewing on that question, and here's what he wrote on his blog. He said, Adrian's answer was that a Christian is someone who believes in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ and lives in light of the implications of that event. He said several commentators have pointed out that that could include Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and so on. It may be an inadequate definition of what it means to be a Christian. He says, and I agree. And then he begins to list some of the specific things that people often point to as marks of faith. And he said, these, these are why I don't think they're sufficient. So he said, for example, water baptism is insufficient to define you as a Christian because there are many people who are baptized who do not persevere. Then he said, expressions of repentance frequently do not result in changed lives either. And then he said, professions of faith in Jesus have all too often been accompanied by thoroughly unchristian lives, especially within Christendom. He said, fruitfulness is obviously a test, but given the wide range of ways in which genuine fruit can be manifested in our lives and false fruit can be feigned, how can we be certain what that looks like? Perseverance in faith, though theologically accurate, is an all but useless test in practice since you can only be sure if somebody's a disciple when they die and we can't be sure while we're still alive, he says. So how do we know if somebody's a Christian or not? Well, if we went down to the river market this morning and we asked the question, what does it mean for somebody to be a Christian? How do you know if somebody's a Christian or not? What, what test do you think would come up Number one, what would the average person who's not a churchgoer say, this is the ultimate test of whether or not somebody's a Christian? Okay, do they go to church? What is it? What Mer Are they a good person? What else? Do they love people? You know, I, I, I think even today, whether you go to church or whether you're a good person, the average person would say, well, those are maybes. But ultimately, the question is, do you love people? That's kind of become the cultural de facto norm about what it means for somebody to be a Christian. Now, we've been looking over the last several months at a letter in the New Testament, 1 John, where John lays out three tests of what it means for somebody to be a Christian. And we've used the, the three words, life and love and beliefs, as the words that help identify the areas in this letter that John identifies the three tests. He says genuine faith is going to be marked by somebody who, where there is, they are a good person. There's a change in their moral character, their moral behavior. They are righteous, to use a biblical word. The choices we make in life are going to be good choices. Now, culturally today, some people will, will elevate some choices above others, right? They'll say, a good person by my definition of what good is, as opposed to what the Bible's definition of good is. Then, then John goes on to say, um, in addition to that, there, there should be a change in how we relate to one another. Our relationship should have a different quality. The, it's the love test. Do we love others? And then it's marked by a change in our beliefs, and particularly in John's context, what's our belief about who Jesus is and about his life and ministry? So back to the poll, if people said, well, I think love is the big test ahead of whether people go to church, uh, I, I think this is viewed as the bottom line. In our culture, if you say you're a Christian, most people today aren't really concerned about whether you believe 
the right things about Jesus or the Bible. They say nobody really knows that stuff for sure. I mean, I have my opinions, you have your opinions. They leave it at that. And as long as you're not hurting anybody, you can kind of live your life however you want. But, at least, again, that's the cultural norm. But if you don't demonstrate love, and again, sometimes that love is, as I understand love should look like, then I don't think you're a Christian. If, you're, if you say you're a Christian and you're somebody who doesn't demonstrate kindness or compassion or sympathy or care for others as the elements of love, then it doesn't, th th this is what people would say, then it doesn't matter what you believe, because after all, who really knows what truth is? And it doesn't matter how morally upright you are, because nobody's perfect and we shouldn't judge others. That's kind of the cultural view. Now, actually, there is some biblical support to the idea that love is the bottom line test. John says there are three tests, but is there one that's more important? Is love more important than belief or moral character? Well, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? Look at it again. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand mysteries and knowledge but have not faith, uh, and have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. He goes on to say, love never ends. These three things abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So there's some biblical warrant for the idea that, that maybe the love test settles out at the bottom as the, the defining test of our faith. And I've made the point throughout this series that I don't think you can take one test away I think all three have to fit. So if you have somebody who, who is a loving, kind person but doesn't believe what the Bible teaches or who doesn't live morally, then I don't think you have a Christian. If you have somebody who believes what the Bible teaches but they don't live morally and don't love, I don't think you have a Christian. If you have somebody who's a moral person but they don't believe what the Bible says, they don't have love, I don't think you have a Christian. I think all three have to be there as defining what it means to be a Christian. But I do think it's safe to say that in our lives, how we love one another is, if not the essential aspect of our faith, it is an essential aspect of our faith when it comes to putting the gospel on display. If, if we want people to understand or to see our faith, then how we love one another is the essential test of putting the gospel on display. But here's what I'm saying. Living a moral life does not put the gospel on display as effectively as loving others. Declaring the right beliefs does not put the gospel on display to a watching world as well as loving one another. Now you say, why do you say that? Because Jesus said it. John chapter 13, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this... All men will know, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said that's the way people are going to know. Not your moral life, not your right beliefs, as essential as those are to defining your Christianity. If we want the world to know that Jesus is Lord and that we are his followers, loving one another is the essential test. Tim Keller says, this about the time in which John lived. He said Christianity at that time was one of hundreds of religions vying in the marketplace of ideas in the Roman Empire. Think about that. Hundreds of religions saying we've got the truth. We can lead you to God. We know the direction. It was not a particularly well-backed religion. It was not particularly well-connected. So why did it sweep every other one away? I mean, if you had, if you'd done a uh, a handicapping poll on which one is going to last 200 years, Christianity would have polled at about 0.2. It didn't have the backing. It didn't have the support. When Christianity, this is Keller again, when he first burst onto the scene in that old Greco-Roman world, it was immediately amazing to the people around because of its love. One of the main reasons the world said something is going on here, maybe these people are children of God, maybe something supernatural really has happened, because we've never seen a religion like this before, never. And it's because not because they said their philosophy seems more right than the other philosophies or their morality seems more moral than the other people, it's because they'd never seen people love each other like this before. Just stop and think about 
how significant this is in terms of our witness for the gospel. How we get along with one another, how we love one another, is essential. Here's what I find myself thinking about, wondering about as we turn to this passage this morning. What would it look like in our day, in Little Rock, if people, or in our country, if people said, maybe these people really are children of God. We've never seen a religion like this before. We've never seen people love each other like this before. Is that even possible in our day? Well, John addresses the critical issue of how we're to love one another in this section. We'll be in here in 1 John this morning. And this is, by the way, the first of six times John is going to say, love one another. So it's a pretty big theme in five chapters if you say six times. If you write a letter to somebody and you repeat the same thing six times, they'll go, I got it, okay? John wants to make sure we got it. So it's a pretty central idea. And we're going to read these verses together to see what John has to say before we read. Join me and let's pray. Lord, we need you this morning. Uh, our minds, we confess, are dull. Our hearts are often hard. We uh, cannot comprehend what your Spirit has for us unless we first have your Spirit at work in us. So uh, soften our hearts, uncloud our minds, prepare us. This is your word. We confess that it is perfect and right and holy, and Lord, we want to conform our lives to what your word teaches. So give us ears to hear and hearts to obey, we pray in your name. All right, 1 John 3. We're, we're actually going to start in the verse we left off with last week at verse 10 because verse 10 is a transition verse from what John was talking about before, which is living rightly, to what he's going to talk about next, which is loving one another. So he starts in verse 10 by saying this, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that when we have passed out of death into life because we love the, or we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Now, just like the previous section where there was a clear juxtaposition of here's what it looks like to live righteously and here's what it looks like to live unrighteously and John was putting those two side by side in this section he's saying here's what it looks like to love and here's what it looks like to hate let's compare and contrast those two John by the way if you haven't noticed until now he's a pretty black and white guy okay John doesn't see a whole lot of gray He's not talking here about kind of loving or about being indifferent. He's talking about they're, they're too, you're, you're either love the brothers or you hate the brothers. And verse 10 really sets this up clearly. He says, in the same way that it's evident who the children of God are by their righteous living, so you can also tell who the children of God are and who they aren't by whether you love your brother. His thesis statement here is in verse 18, the one who does not love his brother is not a child of God. Now, remember what this whole letter is about. How can I know if I'm a child of God? That's question number one. Question number two is, who should I be following who can lead me in the right path to know God? So John is saying, first of all, self-diagnosis. How can I know if I'm a child of God? And secondly, how can I look at people who will be spiritual mentors, directors, spiritual authorities in my lives? And verse 10 says one way is to see if people are aligning their life with God's word? Are they living according to God's word? Are they practicing righteousness? 
Another way is to see, are they loving? Do they have an uncommon love for others? I say uncommon because it's not unusual for us to love people who love us, right? That's pretty easy. Somebody loves you, you go, you know, I like being loved by you. I'll love you back and we'll keep this going. As long as, as long as you love me, I'll love you. You make it easy for me to love you because you love me well. And then there are some people who will say, "What? what uh, I love." I'm sorry. What, what if? What if you look at somebody and you say, um, "I love you," but they're indifferent toward you? So let's say there's somebody you say, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate love toward this person, and you do, and you, you express it, and you do acts of kindness, and you find all kinds of ways to express your love, and that person just shrugs it off. What do you do in that situation? Well, you, you might try again for a little while. You might keep it going a little bit. But after a while, it's like, okay, you're going to shrug me off? I'm going to shrug you off. You're indifferent toward me? You don't respond to my love? I'll just... Be indifferent toward you. Most of us would say we try to be uh, to, to show love to somebody who's indifferent. We're just going to say, I give up. I'm going to quit trying to love that person. We'll ultimately decide you're indifferent toward me. You ignore me. I'll ignore you. For, for someone to say, you know, I'm going to continue to demonstrate love, to show acts of kindness, to, to persevere in, in expressing and demonstrating love for, toward somebody who is indifferent toward me, we would call that uncommon, wouldn't we? We would call that unusual. We would call that supernatural. That's not a natural response. That's a supernatural response. Now, that's with people who are indifferent toward us. What about people who reject us, people who are our enemies, people who, when we respond with love, they don't just shrug it off. They spit in our face. They, they say, I hate you. They don't want to have anything to do with us. The human response to rejection and anger and hatred is to respond with rejection and anger and hatred. You get angry with me, I don't say, well, bless you, you know. You, you hate me, I don't go, you know, I, I just love you so much. Jesus, of course, tells us that God wants us to love others the way he loves people, which means we're to love our enemies, we're to pray for those who despitefully use us. The Bible says God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still hating him, he was loving us. He sent his son. Loving those who reject you or are angry toward you or hate you, this is also uncommon, unusual, supernatural love. So when John says, I want you to love the brothers He's saying, I'm calling you to a kind of love that is higher than natural human love. I'm not saying love those who love you. I'm saying love those who are indifferent toward you and love those who hate you. John says, loving one another is a foundational element. Look at verse 11. He says, this is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. He's saying this is not a new teaching. This is not new revelation. This is core to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You hadn't been a Christian for long when you understood this principle. This is central. Let me point out, when John was talking in these verses about love for one another, he's talking about love in the family of God. There are other places in the Bible where we're told to love people outside of the family of God, but he's saying, I'm going to talk now about how you love each other in the family. That's, that's the test we're looking at here. John has in mind the kind of special love that ought to characterize how we relate to people in the family of God. Let me give you the big picture, kind of the overview of how John sets this out, how he juxtaposes this side by side. You got hate and you got love. He says, first of all, hate is a characteristic of the world. Love is a characteristic of the church. The, the hate dynamic is how the world responds to one another. The love dynamic is characteristic of how the church responds. He says, Satan is the source of hate, and Jesus, or God, is the source of love. He says, Cain is the prototype of what the hater looks like. Jesus is the prototype of what the lover looks like. He says, hate is going to result in destruction and murder. Love is going to result in self-sacrifice and the good of others. 
and he says hate is the evidence of spiritual or is evidence that you're spiritually dead whereas love is evidence that you're spiritually alive so those the, the, the two side by side this is what hate looks like here's where it comes from here's what it results in here's what love looks like here's what it comes where it comes from here's what it results in John Stott summarizes what John is saying here he says hate is negative it seeks the other person's harm it leads to activities against that person even to the point of murder Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him Meanwhile, love is positive. It seeks the other's good. It leads to activity for him, even to the point of self-sacrifice. Laid, Christ laid down his life for us. Pretty easy descriptions of this is what hate looks like. This is what love looks like. And John, to, to bolster his defense about how we ought to love and not hate, he calls his first witness to the stand an interesting witness, an example of what happens when hate begins to become the norm of your life begins to invade your life his witness is the first son of Adam and Eve and that's Cain and so in verse 12 he says we should not be like Cain and he says two things he was of the evil one and he murdered his brother now you remember the story of Cain maybe you don't Genesis chapter 4 Cain is the oldest son of Adam and Eve the first son and uh uh, he's the child who was born after the fall. We'll go back to Genesis 4 and we'll look at this. Genesis 4 and verse 2, it says, Abel, Abel was Cain's younger brother. Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain was a worker of the ground. And I just, this, I'll, I'll just pause right here because this is where my mind goes, right? And I, I just apologize ahead of time, but my mind goes to the musical Oklahoma, the farmer and the cowman should be friends, Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's... Abel's a keeper of the sheep. Cain is a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So far, so good. Both of these boys had apparently been taught by their dad that it is right and appropriate for you to bring the first fruits of your labor to be offered as a sacrifice to God as a way of saying, God, your kingdom, your priorities are my priorities. You're, you get the first. You get the best. God, I'm here for you. That's what this sacrifice is there to demonstrate. Okay, now I'm just going to take a little pause here, a little excursus. We're going to step away from the main idea of this passage, which is about love and hate. And I just want to say that this principle that Adam taught his boys about bringing the first fruits still applies to God's children today. It's still right to offer the first fruits of your labor as a sacrifice to God as a way of declaring that he is first in your life, that his priorities are your priorities. This practice of giving to support God's work is a spiritual discipline that helps keep our hearts aligned with God's priorities in the world. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Now, I, I remember reading that and going, isn't it the other way around? That your heart directs your treasure? But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, when you invest, when you when you put your treasure toward God's work, your heart follows it. He, he's saying you need to be prioritizing your treasure because your heart will get invested. We, we point our hearts in the direction it should go based on what we do with our treasure. Yeah. And, and I just wonder if that's your pattern and that's your practice. Uh, when I was a college student and was first converted, I thought, I wasn't making a whole lot of money, but I thought, you know, I should be giving. And Marianne and I were dating at the time. We had not joined a local church, at, but we were both involved in Young Life, and so I was donating to Young Life every month. It was just, it became a practice. When, when I would get money, I would take the first 10% of that, and I'd send it to Young Life. That's what I did. When we got married, this was just a a pattern for us. It was not something that I remember us even talking about. It was just kind of like, well, that's, duh, that's what you do. Now, we have, over the years, we've followed some principles as it relates to how we are going to 
handle our giving. And I'm just going to share these with you, not because you need to do what we're doing, but this is just how we processed it. We, we determined that the primary place for our giving should go, uh, for our giving to go, should be our local church. We, we decided that because the primary source of spiritual growth in our lives was our time at church. We, we wanted to give to where we were growing. We wanted to give to what was pouring into us. We wanted to give back to that. So we determined early on, I was, I was dealing with, so 10%, is that how it's supposed to work? You know, and you go back to the Old Testament, and it's actually, it's, there, are, there are different tithes, and it's 23 and a third percent, and is it supposed to be that much? And do you tithe on the net, or do you tithe on the gross? You've had these conversations, right? So, yeah, so we said, okay, here's what we'll do. We're going to make sure that at least 10% of the net goes to the church. And then we said we're going to take the other, the, the gap between net and gross, and we're going to make sure that we fill in, we get to at least 10% of the gross by giving to other ministries, to parachurch ministries and other places where God is pouring into us. So we divided that up. We said we're going to give to some ministries that are proclamation ministries that proclaim the gospel, and we're going to give to some ministries that are demonstration ministries where where they are, it's a... It's, uh, human concerns, right? So we'll give some money to uh, uh, maybe somebody who's like like uh, R.C. Sproul's ministry. We'd give some money to R.C. Sproul's ministry, and then we'd give money to Compassion International as, as a way of doing that. We wanted to make sure that when you took church and what we were doing to parachurch, you got over 10% of the gross. So that's how we figured it out. And then we said, we want to try to do this every year. We want to make sure that what we give next year is more than what we gave last year. Rather than going, okay, we're kind of here, we just wanted to get aggressive with it. And so if we gave 10% last year, what would 10 and a half look like this year? Or if we were giving $100 a month to the church, what would it look like to give um, 120 this year or 110 this year? What would, how do we just up it every year? Now, have there been years where we fell short of our goals or years like years where we faced unexpected expenses? Well, I was thinking back on this, and he here's what I can remember. I can remember months where we said, okay, cash on a cash basis this month, <clears throat> we can't do this, right? So there have been months where our cash was tight and we weren't giving, but, you know, we always tried to make it up. Not just to say, well, that month's gone, we'll go on to the next month. No, how can we go back and cover those months when cash was tight? That was just our pattern. I remember one, we moved a couple of times. We weren't a part of a local church uh, yet. We were still trying to find a church. And, and I've never been big on this. You go to the church and you visit and you put 30 bucks in the offering plate. It's kind of like, yeah, thanks. For, you know, like, like you paid the concert fee to come to church that morning, right? I, I want to be investing in kingdom work. I want to know what do I think about this church before I'm investing. So if we've got this money we're earning but we're not giving somewhere, what do we do with that? Well, in our case, we would either increase what we were doing to parachurch ministries during that season or we'd start putting some aside and once we found the church, then we wrote them a big check and said, don't expect this every month, all right? We've been saving this up for a while, right? Now, I would say we were not obsessive about any of this. This was just a habit. It, this was not something we talked about or thought about. It was just, this is what you do. It's kind of like, I don't know, and, and, and maybe this is the issue for some of you, and I'm not presuming this, but, but we don't sit down and go, should we pay the electric bill this month or not, right? No, we, we pay the electric bill. Yeah, should we get groceries this, this month or not? It, this is just what we do. Should we give to the Lord's work this month? Of course. In fact, before groceries. And may, we can turn up the air conditioning. I mean, yeah, turn it up, not down, right? We can, we can go cheaper, but we want to give. Well, uh, uh, I, I say all of that just to challenge your thinking. Apparently, Adam had taught, <laughs> this is early formation stuff. Adam had taught Cain and Abel. Before they knew a whole lot, one of the foundation principles was, look, boys, when you, when you have sheep and when you grow crops, you give the first part of that to the Lord. And the boys knew that. And so here they are in Genesis chapter Four, and that's what they're doing. All right, we'll get back to the story. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Abel comes, God says, I'm pleased. Cain comes, God says, I'm not pleased. 
Now, why did God receive Abel's offering and reject Cain's offering? Well, there's a clue in Genesis 4, down in verse 7, God tells Cain, if you do well, will it not be accepted? So apparently he didn't accept it because Cain was not doing well. And in other words, there's a hint that Cain was not living a life that was pleasing the Lord, but was trying to make offering and sacrifice as well. And, and you, don't, you don't live an unrighteous life and say, well, I'll buy God off with my sacrifice. And I would just say back to talking about giving and church and all that, don't, don't think it's okay for you to live however you want, and then you just, as long as you're giving, kind of God's on the hook. No, God, you don't give because God needs your money. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. You give as an expression of joy and thanks because your life is prioritized around the things of God. So why doesn't God accept Cain's offering? Well, Proverbs 15 says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. Why didn't he accept it? Because Cain was wicked. Because he was not, he hadn't prioritized his life around God. That's what it says in 1 John. He says, why didn't he do it? Because he was evil. He was of the devil. Back to Genesis 4. So Cain is very angry. His face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will, it, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, look at this. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That, that ought to be a sober warning to all of us. If you do not do well, here's where sin is. Sin is hiding behind the door ready to pounce on you. Crouching, why do you crouch at the door? You crouch at the door to attack, to surprise, to, to pounce on somebody. Sin is crouching at the door. It's waiting to attack you. Its desire is to control you, but you have to rule over it. But that's not what Cain chose to do. When God said, you've got to live right, Cain responded to that by speaking to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. God says, if you do right, I'll accept your offering. And he says, forget that, and goes out and kills his brother. It's an interesting story for John to reference when he's telling us we should love our brothers and not hate like Cain. I mean, most of us would say, okay, I don't hate anybody like Cain, right? Anybody ever killed your brother? Well, maybe we shouldn't, I mean, but I don't think, right? So why does he pick Cain, this extreme example of somebody who irrationally kills his brother? Why does he pick him as the example of saying, don't hate like Cain? Well, first of all, to show that hate has been around from the beginning, like from right after the fall, this is the first thing they're dealing with after, after shame and blame shifting in chapter 3. Now you get to hatred for one another. And then to show because they're brothers, he's talking about loving the brethren. We're talking about natural-born brothers who couldn't get along. And, and to show that unchecked, unchecked hate will morph into murder unchecked hate, undomesticated hate becomes murder. And because he heard Jesus, John heard Jesus say there's a connection between hate and murder. Back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you've heard it said don't murder, and you're all thinking, well, I'm good. But I say to you, Jesus says, don't hate your brother. And if you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So John answers the question of why Cain killed Abel. He said in verse... 12, he says, why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's deeds were righteous. <laughs> Interesting. Why did he murder him? Because he was jealous. Because his brother showed him up. Because he didn't like having Mr. Goody Two-Shoes around. You know, and God being pleased with him and he thought, the way I'm going to deal with this is get rid of him. You ever had somebody who their goodness exposed your lack of goodness? And you're kind of like, I don't want that guy around. I want to get rid of that person. You wish they'd just go away. And let me just pause here again and remind you. When you are angry or bitter or jealous or resentful of someone, what you have in your heart with that emotion is what I heard one pastor call a murder embryo. Think about that. When, when you are angry jealous, resentful, when there's bitterness in your heart, what's there is a murder embryo. And the point that John makes in verse 15 
of chapter 3 is he says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He's saying everybody who hates his brother, you got murder in your heart. It's there. You may say, well, I'd never kill him. So you don't know yourself that well. You, you can't have God's spirit abiding in you. You can't have received the gift of eternal life and be content to harbor hate in your heart for the brothers. If, if you don't deal with the anger and the bitterness, the jealousy and the resentment, it will grow. It is crouching at the door. It will destroy you and it will destroy the people around you. So you have to stop here and go, is there somebody in my life that I'm harboring hatred toward? Now, some of you will go, I, I read the text. There is, but they're not a brother, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> okay? No, like I said, there are other verses for that. But we'll just stick to the brothers for now, all right? Can you, is there somebody you know who professes faith in Christ, and yet you, you're holding on to anger or bitterness toward that person? You have a resentment that you've never addressed with that person? You haven't addressed it in your own heart? You've said to yourself, well, I'll love them, but I just want nothing to do with them anymore. What does that mean? I, I'll, I'll love them, but I just never want to see them again. Those are two contradictory statements. Colossians chapter 3 is really helpful here. It says we're to put to death what is earthly in us. And then it lists a bunch of things, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So it lists out some pretty bad behavior. It says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, once you, wa you once walked, you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And then look at this list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Those are, those are murder embryos right there. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. If you have this in your heart towards somebody else, this is an indication that you're harboring hate for that person. And, and you just need to hear this. Hateful Christian is an oxymoron. I love God, but I hate so-and-so. Those two statements don't go together. Sadly, a lot of Christians today have reputations as haters. Even more sadly, sometimes we deserve it. Sometimes there are whole churches of people who are built around self-righteousness and anger and hate toward sin. Now, let me give you some tips on how we should deal with it. Because should we hate sin? Yeah, the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. That's what the Old Testament tells us. So we should hate sin. But we, how do we make sure that our hate for sin does not morph into hate for people? Yeah, you've heard, hate the sin, love the sinner. You've heard that, right? That can kind of be a cliche. It, it, it's true, but it can kind of get thrown around like I've got justification for being angry toward you when you're sin. Now, let me give you some tips on how we, how we can hate sin but not hate people. First of all, make sure that the sin you hate the most is your sin. Just let that soak in for a little bit, okay? Make sure the sin you hate the most is not their sin, it's your sin. We are much better at hating the sin of others than we are at hating our own sin. Jesus said that. He said you can easily spot the speck in somebody else's eye, but you can't see the log in your own eye. Deal with your own log. So if, if you say, I just hate sin, how often do you look at your own life and go, man, I hate the sin in me? Here's a second thing. Cultivate compassion for those who are ensnared in sin. Rather than being angry and hateful toward the sin that they're demonstrating, how can you be compassionate toward these people who are enslaved in sin? By the way, unbelievers, <coughs> here's one of the things that they do. They sin. Some of them sin boldly and loudly. And we can look at their bold, loud sinning and we can go, I hate that but and 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 their behavior is is contemptible but the people are ensnared and trapped they're blinded they, they're like you were before christ came and changed you so rather than being angry toward them be compassionate toward them remember
remember Jesus standing outside Jerusalem preparing before the triumphal entry he's looking at Jerusalem which is covered by the Pharisees which is is their home and what does he do he weeps he, before he ever gets out the whips and overturns the money changers tables which by the way he's Jesus he can do it he said it's my house so th th don't look at what Jesus didn't say. Good, let's go get the whips, right? <laughs> no, but you can imitate Jesus by looking at it and weeping. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How, how often I've wanted to gather you in my arms, but you wouldn't do this. Cultivate compassion for, the, for people who are sinning boldly. I, I got to tell you, there's a lot in the news today about parades that are happening all around the country today. Does that... Does that spark in you first anger or compassion? I would suggest to you that a part of not harboring hate in your heart is to train your heart toward compassion, to train your heart to love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. So when you see news coverage of parades, just, just be moved to pray, Lord. Would you, by your mercy, draw these people to yourself? And third, if you're angry at evil, make sure the anger and your hatred toward evil is because of how that evil offends God, not because of how it offends you. I mean, is there such a thing as, as humans having righteous indignation? Yes, I, th I think there is, but I think you've got to be aware that that you may have 90% righteous indignation, but there's probably still 10% that's kind of like, and I'm ticked because of me, too. It's not just because God's glory is being offended. It's because I don't like what's going on. We should hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. Those two are connected, but we're not to hate evildoers. <coughs> Do not be overcome by evil, Romans says. What? Overcome evil with good. So back to verse 13 of 1 John 3, John adds this interesting statement. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Just as Cain was provoked to hatred and murder by the righteousness of Abel, we can expect that as we live lives that are holy and blameless and upright, as we live lives that are pure, even if we're seeking to love others, don't be surprised when they hate you. Don't be surprised that as hard as you try to be kind and compassionate, there are people who are still going to hate you. Why do they hate you? Because they hate Jesus. That's what Jesus said. They hated me before they hated you, so you live like me, you can expect they're going to hate you. They put me to death. You live like me, don't be surprised when they say, we got to get him out of here. They take a Cain-like approach and say, we are sick of your righteousness and they move you aside. Let me show you a couple of interesting verses from Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth uh, set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's against Yahweh and against his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Why do the kings of the earth take aim against God and the Messiah? because they see Jesus and God as bringing bonds, cords. We're not going to be enslaved by what Jesus tells us. We're not going to be enslaved by having to do what God says. These, the reason these men and women hate God and Jesus is because they see God's call to righteousness as bonds and chains. And they go to war against him to keep themselves unfettered from those bonds or chains. All they're doing is saying, we want to stay in slavery to sin, not be bound to God. And the same is true for us. As we proclaim God's word, as we live it out in our own lives, it's going to provoke the godless people around us to want to hate us. To, they want to refuse to submit to God. This is why Jesus is a stumbling stone, why the godless hate the godly. Okay, Jesus, John sums up what he's saying about love and hate. Uh, in verse 14, he puts the two side by side. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Love for the brothers is an indicator of spiritual life. Hatred for the brothers is an, indicated, an indication that you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. You're spiritually dead. Again, John 
is black and white here. Don't hate love. But love and hate don't exist on a uh, on a um, alternate scale. It's not like a light switch where you turn on love, you turn off hate. It's not like it comes on full or it's off completely. Love and hate have more of a continuum. So let me give you an example of how this works, and we'll use a, a current example since the U.S. women's national team is now in the semifinals, going to be playing in London on Tuesday. Some of you are really excited about this. Okay, so let's put this up. This is the attitude line. So on one side of the attitude line, you have people who say, I hate soccer. And then you have people who are like, well, I, I don't like soccer. And then you have people in the middle who are neutral. And then you have people who are like, I like soccer. Then you have people, I really like soccer. And then I love soccer. And then I absolutely love soccer. That's the continuum, right? So I don't know where you are on the soccer line. You may hate soccer. You may love soccer. Or you may be in the middle. It's kind of like, I don't care. Love and hate are in that same way. You, you're not either one or the other. You can be somewhere along that attitude line. So when John says, love the brothers, where do you think he would put it on the soccer continuum? Would he say, in order to be loving the brothers, you have to be at least someplace past neutral. You have to at least like them. To love the brothers, you don't have to really love them, just like them. No, no, you have to really, really like them. No, when he's saying love the brothers, he's saying you should be moving toward the love end of the continuum. As with everything in our sanctification, we're in a progressive path. And it's not about the perfection of our lives, it's about the direction of our lives. So what direction are you moving in? Are you moving in your relationships with the brothers toward a pure love, or are you sliding into hate? We, you recognize the seeds of hate in your heart. You see that you're harboring it. What do you do? Do you put it to death? Do you pull it up? Do you call it what it is, sinful and demonic, confess it, and, and turn from it? And, and as for love for the brothers, if you're thinking, you know, I do have some room to grow here, do you start to practice the things that cause love to grow in your life? Do you cultivate habits? Let's, we'll look at another continuum. This is a reverse of the soccer continuum. Hate's on the other side of love. But love is laying down your life for somebody. Hate is murder on the extreme ends of the continuum. In the middle, you've got love in action, which is giving and seek, serving, helping, kind words, etc., on the hate side, you've got avoidance, slander, verbal attacks, envy, physical attacks. In the middle, on the hate side, you've got indifference. On the love side, you've got compassion. And you think, well, I think compassion's a good word. Well, compassion just means that, that I feel what you feel, but I don't do anything about it. Okay, so compassion is, yeah, I kind of feel your pain. I'm just not doing anything about it. So on, on one end, there's murder. On the other side, you lay down your life. Uh, in, indifference really is is uh, an indication that you're on the hate side of things. If you would say, I'm just indifferent toward that person, I would say you're on the wrong side of the line. To love the brothers, you can't say indifference is a, a subset of love. No, indifference is the beginning of hate. And compassion is where love begins. It, it's not love, but it's moving in the right direction. John is telling us that when we experience the new birth, when we pass from death to life, here's what happens. We have a new impulse, and again, this is an unusual, uncommon, supernatural impulse. This new impulse is, I should lay down my life to serve you. Where'd that come from? That's not a natural inclination. When, you, when we slip into patterns of, of slander or bitterness or resentment or anger or malice, things that lead to hate, the Holy Spirit brings conviction now and causes us to say, that's not how you should be living. You didn't have that impulse in your life before, but now so, there's something that taps you on the shoulder and says, no, 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 that's not how children of God live. And at the same time, as we begin to cultivate the virtues associated with love, kindness, and encouragement, we begin to practice these virtues and habits, the Holy Spirit fuels that, gives us energy for that, and we grow in love. So, this is, John is saying, you should love the brothers, and, and how you love the brothers is by understanding what love is first, and then cultivating that. And John gives us one specific spiritual discipline that will help us cultivate love. It's in verse 17. He says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk but in deed and in truth. Sounds like the same thing James says in James 2, right? Don't say you have faith and then don't demonstrate it. 
or what Jesus says in Matthew 25 about the sheep and the goats? What, what did these do? They, they demonstrated love for, for others. What did these do? They didn't. Serving our brothers and sisters, finding ways to care for the needs of others, this is something that requires wisdom. And there's a book that I just, I'll recommend to you. It's a book that elders and deacons have read here at the church, a book that will help you understand how to cultivate wisdom as we serve people around us. The title of the book is When Helping Hurts. And the subtitle is How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself. And here's what the authors talk about in the book. They say poverty is much more than simply a lack of material resources, and it takes much more than donations and handouts to solve it. Some alleviation efforts, failing to consider the complexities of poverty, have actually and unintentionally done more harm than good. In this book, they say our goal is to encourage all of us to see the dignity of everyone, empower the material, materially poor, and know that we're all uniquely needy, that God in the gospel is reconciling all things to himself. This is a book that says when you see somebody in need, giving them $10 may actually hurt them more than help them. That requires wisdom. You don't want to disable dysfunction. You don't want to build dependency. You, but John says, here's what you don't do. Don't close your heart. Okay? So if, if the choice is, I'll either close my heart or give them $10, give them the $10. Don't close your heart. But giving the $10, you just have to recognize, may not be helping them or helping you. It may just be guilt uh, assignment. So if, if somebody is in need, what you need to do is come around them and help them build a life where they're not in need anymore, where they can take care of their needs, where they can learn to rely on God for their needs, where they can, where, where they can take care of themselves, and you help make that happen. John Stott says, just as life does not dwell in the murderer, so love does not dwell in the miser. One of the signs of a transformed life is that it is a poured out life. Your life is not about you anymore. It's about loving God and loving others. That's what you live for. That's where you find your joy. That's where you find life is in living for God and living for others. You recognize living for me, there's no life there. Living for God, pouring out my life for others. There's life and joy and peace in that. Paul described it. He said to the Philippians, he said, I'm pouring out my life as a drink offering to you. And that's what it should look like. Well, we'll close here. <sighs> yeah, we've had a lot to cover this morning, right? How do we grow in love for others? How do we grow in love for one another? If, if you would look at your life and say, I, I need to grow on that love thing. That impulse is not as strong in me as it ought to be. What, what do we do? Well, verse 16 is where we go back to. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. How do you grow in love? You look at the example of Jesus. You look at the model of Jesus. Later in this letter, John is going to say, we love because he first loved us. L love is is not something we find in ourselves and pour out to others. Love is something we receive from God and then pour out to others. If you're looking for the great reservoir of love in you to be the dispenser of love to others, you will find that drains quick. But if you're looking for an unending supply of love that you can then pour out to the brothers, that comes as you receive God's love for you and it spills out toward others. You, you don't have it in you to love one another. <laughs> but God has it in him. This is what John's saying. If you want to know that you've experienced the new birth, you're now a child of God, pay attention to whether you have these new impulses in your life. Do you, do, is there something in you calling you to lay down your life for others? Do, do you sense that? Is that a part of what you're led toward? And if you don't have that impulse, or if, if you're trying to conjure it up inside yourself and it's not there, and maybe, just maybe, the issue is that you've never been plugged into the source of love in the first place. You don't know the one who demonstrated his love for this, and while you were still his enemy, he died for you. Maybe today's the day for you to pass from death to life so that you can first receive God's love and then pour it out to others. If, if you know Jesus, but you still find that there are seeds of anger or indifference or hate or ignoring people or dismissing people, rejecting people, 
and that you should be loving them, here's how you can start your journey back toward love. First, confess that that's wrong. <laughs> confess that anger and hatred and malice toward others is wrong. If there's somebody you're holding on to and harboring hate, confess, Lord, that's a sin against you. And start to focus your heart today on what this table behind me symbolizes. The elements that are on this table symbolize God's love demonstrated for us in the death of Christ. You want to cultivate love in your heart? Reflect on God's love for you. Here's what I would challenge you toward. The, the more you understand God's love poured out for you, the harder it is to harbor hate in your heart toward others. You can't hold those in tension. If you're har harboring hate, meditate on the cross. Meditate on the gospel. Meditate on how God has demonstrated his love for you. And the more you understand that and the more you're broken by that, the harder it is to hate others. We practice what's called open communion here at Redeemer. We're about to come to the Lord's table and receive these elements. If you're here this morning and you would say, I'm not sure I know Jesus. I'm, I'm not sure that I have that love impulse in me. Then rather than coming and receiving these elements, we just encourage you, take some time, think about what you've heard this morning. We're going to have some prayers up on the screen while we do communion. Look at those prayers. Think about that. Nobody's going to be looking around going, who's taken, who's not? Like, that's not the deal here. But we want you to just stop and consider, and we'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you after the service. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a, a visitor and a guest and you would say, I'm in with Jesus. I, I love the Lord. He is, he's got first place in my life. There's stuff I need to clean up, sure. There's stuff that's, there's junk there. But he's my priority. Then you're welcome to come to the table and receive the elements. This is, this is a means of grace for us. God strengthens us as we pause, not just to take cracker and juice. You can do that at your house and it doesn't do any good. The, the, the strength is not in the cracker or in the juice. The, the strength, the grace, is found in our meditation on what those represent, the cross, the blood. And so you meditate on that in your heart. And I just say to you, ask God during this time before you come, just say, Lord, is there anybody that I'm holding on to hatred, that I'm harboring hate toward? Is there anybody I need to be cultivating love for? Or is that a general characteristic I need to cultivate? And then ask God to begin the process, begin that work in you. And again, we'd love to help walk you through that if there are issues to deal with there. You prepare your hearts while we prepare the table this morning.